Talk and Rock Radio. Where friends meet at the intersection of life, inspiration, and music. Here's your host, Rick Kern. Welcome, everyone, to Talk and Rock Radio. If you're a fan of Buffalo Springfield, Poco, and Loggins and Messina, then you're going to enjoy today's episode. From Franklin, Tennessee, my guest today is the legendary Jim Messina. How you doing, Jim? I'm doing good. Doing real good, actually. I'm, I got my morning Joe, and I'm I'm here. Very, very cool. You know, I first of all, I want to, before we get into this, thank you for coming on my show today. I know you've been hitting it very hard lately with lots of tours and coming back home a little bit and going to graduations and doing all kinds of stuff. So I just want to thank you for making the time. It's taken us a couple months to finally get this thing uh, wrapped up and ready to go. So, uh, you know, I, pre I really appreciate it. You bet. My pleasure. I want to start first by jumping back to your early childhood. I want to take this thing back to when you're five years old. I think that's about the time you learned how to play guitar. Is that right? When you first started playing guitar? Yeah. My dad was, uh, my, my mentor, you might say he, uh, I, I loved to watch him play when I was a little guy. And, uh, one day he just started putting my fingers, you know, where they needed to be to play certain chords. And, and that was, uh, that was the, um, the root of it all. And here I am at 76, still doing the same thing. There you go, man. Well, you know, related to that, what pivotal point can you say in your life was the defining moment that you decided that music was going to be your life business? Probably when I was about 13, uh, as, as I was going into high school, I, I, uh, I was pretty young, graduated at 17. And uh, my first year um, uh, of high school, the summer before, my parents moved from Manhattan Beach which I was getting ready to go into high school there. And I was a surfer kid, you know, and I had Pendleton shirts and Converse tennis shoes and, you know, 501 jeans. And uh, hell, I thought I was it until we moved to the Inland Empire, which was not a lot about surfing, but a lot about FFA. And I went from the, you know, California surfing scene to the future farmers of America and I was bummed out. I just thought, you know, what am I doing here? <laughs> How did this to me? So my grandmother lived down the street. We lived uh, alongside a, 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 an orange uh, grove. And uh, I was really bored that summer. So I went to talk to my grandma, who was also a singer. My grandpa was a, uh, they were in vaudeville. You know, they were pretty old by that time. But she says, well, you know, there's a little boy up the street who, who's a musician and, and uh, I know he's, you know, looking for some friends. Maybe you should just introduce yourself and maybe the two of you could have some fun together. So I did. His name was David Archuleta. He was a sax player. So we became, uh, we became fast friends. And the next thing, you know, I, I was saying, Hey, let's always find some other musicians. And so I started looking around and put together a little band and, um, we were playing, you know, the songs that I was learning and living at the beach, you know, Dick Dale and the Deltones and the Ventures and, uh, uh, you know, the court Torquays and uh, uh, the Champs and stuff like that. And so um, we wanted to earn some money that summer. And so I asked my mom to contact the local Grand Terrace Country Club to see if we could play there. And of course, they turned us down. What did they want? A bunch of 13 year old kids, right? <laughs> But then we got a call back and they said, you know, <clears throat> we were wondering if the, maybe your son and his friends would like to play down at the pool house on Friday and Saturday nights, you know, to the kids that, uh, well, let's put it this way. Most of the people that went to the Grand uh, Terrace Country Club were uh, pilots in the U.S. Air Force because there was an Air Force base there. <coughs> and, you know, <clears throat> pilots uh, are very much like sailors. They don't feel good on land unless they have a couple of martinis that, you know, <laughs> unstabilize the, the ground. <clears throat> so um, 
they'd be up there having dinner, drinking martinis, and their kids would be down by the pool, and we were entertaining them. And we, uh, you know, we were paid um, Shirley Temples, uh, <clears throat> all the cokes we can drink. And I, I just got a sense at that time that this is what I wanted to do. The kids uh, really loved the music <clears throat> and, uh, you know, starting to become acquainted with instruments. And, and uh, I didn't have a very expensive one, but um, I later found refuge in a used Stratocaster, which really was exciting to me. So the whole process from about 13 years of age, I played all through high school Um when I got to the first group was called the Boutonnieres. Uh, then we went to the Pendletons. Then we went to the Jesters. <clears throat> Excuse me. And somewhere around uh, <clears throat> probably the 11th grade, uh, I was asked to um, make a record for a company called uh, Audio Fidelity. And uh, they took me into Hollywood at a place called Audio Arts, and they recorded all the songs that I had, uh, you know, been writing while I was in high school. Uh, and of course, in those days, you know, myself, my mother, nobody knew anything about the record business, but they managed to steal all of my publishing and half of all my songwriters. Uh, and I probably did not have very much of a, a royalty rate. I mean, I, I don't know where those contracts went, but they couldn't have been much if they were stealing everything else, right? <clears throat> and then they took... <clears throat> and, and overdubbed dragster sounds on over the recordings and called it Jim Messina and the dragsters. <clears throat> and I can only assume <clears throat> that that must've been what was popular at that point in time, dragster racing. So that was, you know, something they were trying to market and produce. They had a young kid for really nothing to, to make an album with. So, uh, but for me, it was a thrill. Um, I never made any money off of it, but it was certainly fun to be able to have an album with my picture on it and and in the 11th grade and somewhere around that time I got uh, noticed by a man um, named Glenn Edwards who was a disc jockey working um, at KEZY radio at the Disneyland hotel and uh, he had a re small record label and he wanted to know if I would produce for him and I, I didn't know what that meant and then he said well I just want you to <clears throat> come into town I've got a couple of groups, solo artists. I want you to listen to their music. And uh, if you like it, I'd like you to take them into the studio. And if anything needs to be changed or you're not happy with anything, you just tell them what you want. And uh, I got you an engineer. His name is Mike Duro. I still am in touch with Mike Duro from all those years. Um, and that's where I began my producing career <clears throat> in the 11th grade uh, while I was still in high school. Well, you're you're a studio engineer, producer, songwriter, performer. Um, out of all of those, are there any one of them that you're most passionate about? Well, they're all equally important, and I I've had to give equal um, time to each. Uh, I mean, in the last couple of days, I've been crawling around on the floor, <clears throat> hooking up patch bays and rerouting. Um, circuits so that uh, I can it's a lot easier for me to patch when I'm here in the studio but uh, it's all it's all important to me and has been in my career uh, every element of it has given me the opportunity to excel to the point to where I could move on to the other uh, probably the, the first part of my career was obviously playing guitar and performing as a as an entertainer I would I wouldn't say as an artist at that time I was an entertainer and as time went on and I became, you know, a producer and then an engineer and then started back into actually playing bass for the Buffalo Springfield. I, I wasn't even playing my, my guitar. Um, and then being around people who were more songwriter oriented, singer songwriter oriented, it began to inspire me as to what I might be able to do, given who I am and how I feel and how I think, which was another opportunity to learn how to expand my creativity as a songwriter and then eventually as a singer songwriter so it's all it's all very important to me uh really from the trip from the resistor up to the legalese uh nowadays you know i have to pretty much uh well i do all my own contracts and read them and then if there's something i don't understand i send them to the attorney and let them 
review it and rewrite it or change it to have the proper legal impact. But I, I need to be very aware of the contracts that I sign and uh, language that's unacceptable and uh, make sure the revisions are not in, are still in my best interests. So it, it's all important. The whole, the whole uh, process. Um, it's not whether I enjoy one better or not. They're all work. Uh, what's important is to get them done, get them done right, make sure it feels right um, and do the very best of my ability to, to do the best that I can. And sometimes that's uh, successful in the sense of uh, economic success. Uh, sometimes it's not, uh, but that's the way the world turns, right? Exactly. You have such a, a great history with Buffalo Springfield, Poco, you know, Loggins and Messina. Are there any particular standout moments that you want to talk about that, that happened while you were with those groups? Oh golly, this uh, <laughs> it's like where do you begin? I I would say pro probably in the Buffalo Springfield, one of the standout moments was for me. It was a series of things. Uh, I was working as a recording engineer at um, uh, Sunset Sound Recorders, and uh, Gypsy, who was the engineer, uh, excuse me, the um, manager there the studio uh, came to me in the afternoon and she said, listen, can you do a session tomorrow morning around 10 a.m.? And I said, well, depends on how late I get out of here, but I, I guess I can. And she says, well, I, I've got you booked on a session. Maybe you can make sure you you know get done fairly early or let them know that you need to. Because sometimes I'd work till 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning with an act. Mm -hmm. Most of them like to work late. <clears throat> so at any rate, I managed to, uh, you know, um, work that out. But before I, before I left her, I said, uh, who, 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 what do you want me to do? And she says, well, I just want you to do a demo session in the morning. It's just voice and guitar. And I said, who's it with? And she says, uh, David Crosby. <laughs> I went, David Crosby. Um, is, is that, is that, uh, Bean Crosby said it? She goes, I don't think so. Uh, and, and if I were you, I would not ask. I said, okay. So I show up the next morning and and he's there uh, and he says, I need you to set up a microphone for vocal and a, and a, and a guitar mark for acoustic guitar. And uh, and then I want the lights dimmed in here and uh, I want you to plug in this this lamp. And I thought, well, what is that? He says, it's a it's a um, it's a lamp. Uh, what do they call it? They had the, the lava lamp, lava lamp. Yeah. I'd never seen one before. And I said, what is it? And he says, it's a lava lamp. Just plug it in. <laughs> I plugged I mean, it they, in. They didn't have any of those up in the Topanga Canyon when you guys were up there, man? Well, they did, but I I, I was too busy working to, to sit home and look at one. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I plugged it in, turned the lights out. The artist shows up. <clears throat> so woman. And, uh, you know, I set everything up, press the record. We turned the lights down in the control room. And she began to sing one song after the other. And I remember hearing the music and I thought to myself, wow, this, this lady can sing pretty good. And, uh, and she played a lot of open tunings and stuff. And, and I thought, wow, she's really a, a good, good guitar player. I'm thinking all this to myself. And <clears throat> as I'm listening, I'm, I'm realizing that the images coming out of the speakers, you know, of, the songs and the lyrics that she was singing was, was really compelling, really different than most of the stuff that, you know, I was working on. So when we got done with the session, <clears throat> I asked him, I said, who's the producer on this? And he said, me, David Crosby. And I'm, I'm writing out David Crosby. And I said, I wonder if I should ask him if he's being son. I said, no, I better not. I said, <laughs> <laughs> and um, so then I, I said, well, who's the art, uh, who's the singer? And she, he says, Joni Mitchell. So I wrote Joni Mitchell down and I thought, cool. you know, cause I never heard of her before. She, this was her first time here to actually <clears throat> start recording. And um, it was a real treat to, to hear an artist, not know who they are, hear their music and be moved by it. And then for her to go on and be successful from that album 
of demos that we cut was really thrilling to see over the years because obviously as, as I moved on in life, so did she, but um, that was wonderful. And then from there, I think it was David that told uh, the band, um, Buffalo Springfield, that he worked with a young engineer and that perhaps the next time they're in there to, you know, to book me on their dates, which um, in a roundabout way that eventually happened. And I was on their sessions starting from uh, uh, the new Buffalo Springfield Again album. And uh, uh, when I first met the band, it was Neil that I met first. And uh, I, I assumed he was the producer because he was the only one there and had all the tapes. And, and uh, we began <clears throat> listening and assembling, you know, what that album would be. And it was then that I discovered that um, Bluebird, which had been released as a single already, was that band because I remember coming home at nights, listening to the radio at two or three in the morning, and I remember hearing that song, and uh, I didn't know what the band was. I'd never heard of the Buffalo Springfield. But um, suddenly I went, oh, wow, that's that band that I really liked the music from. And to be sitting with a group that I liked their music was um, was wonderful because you don't always get that as an engineer. Sometimes you, I had Marachi bands, they couldn't even speak English and I'd ask them to count them up and they go C and they go, ah, boom, and then they'd start playing. And I'd, geez, how am I gonna cut this thing? <clears throat> so it was a thrill to, uh, you know, to be with the group. And then I met Steven. Um, Neil was very methodical and seemed to, you know, have a, a sense in, in those days of what he wanted. Uh, he wasn't quite literate yet in recording techniques, but wanted to learn and always asking questions about how to do this, how to do that. Uh, Stephen, on the other hand, was uh, was more impetuous. He walk in, uh, let's start right now. Where do I go? And I go, okay, wait a minute, we got to set up mics and <laughs> do all that stuff. But he was always in a groove. I mean, he just a lot of people thought he was kind of stuck up. Uh, and self-centered, but I do believe the truth was that he just had music flowing through him all the time and um, was just always in that mo mode of, of, of creating and writing and feeling music. Um, Richie was different. Richie was, uh, you know, he was a singer songwriter, um, wasn't as educated in the aspects of recording or writing music charts and things like that a really good singer and, and I thought uh, at that time a really good songwriter. Um, and of course he was a, a big part of the support system in that band because he lended his voice to the harmonies and stuff that they did. So as a team, I think uh, the three of them um, really not only sounded great together, but when they did take the time to work together, the music was great. Um, then I got a call from Ahmed Erdogan one night um, we'd finished doing the Springfield album, uh, Springfield Again album. Mm -hmm. I got a call one night from <clears throat> Ahmed Erdogan. It, it's 10, 10 o'clock at night in California. Had to be at least one in the morning for him because he was in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, asked me if I'd consider producing the Buffalo Springfield. And uh, I said, uh, well, uh, I mean, why are you choosing me? And he says, well, the guys seem to really like working with you and you've done a great job on the record. And I understand you've produced records and, and uh, would you consider it? And I said, sure, I would. And so I got the job of producing them. And so when we started the, the their third album, which would be eventually named last time around, and at the time I didn't know that because <laughs> uh, the group seemed to be doing well and, and, and my you know my my humble opinion that's from an outsider's point of view um and so we started making that um that that third album and then all of a sudden uh bruce palmer the bass player got himself busted and um as the story goes or as it was told me um he was he was a you know he was a spiritual guy. He he liked indulging in all kinds of spirits, and one of which he liked <laughs> he liked smoke. Yeah. <laughs> and apparently, what he was smoking was not uh, legal, 
So uh, he called the police to complain about the neighbors making some noise and the police show up and they're at the front door and they said, uh, are you Bruce Palmer? Yes. Uh, you said there was a no noise disturbance happening? He goes, yeah, yeah. He says, and you hear that? And they said, no, we don't, we don't really hear anything. And he said, well, come on in. Let me. So he brings them in. He says, you hear it now? And they said, no, we don't hear anything. So he goes over to the wall and puts his hand against the wall. And he says, do you hear that? And so the guy goes over there and he says, and he looks down at the table and he looks at Bruce. And he goes, yeah, I can hear that. <laughs> Let's go down that, to the state. That was the, the, that was the big Buffalo Springfield bust in Topanga, right? No, that was that was later. <laughs> oh, that was later. Okay, <laughs> different but, but story. This <laughs> is hard. He he busted himself, and they they sent him out to send him back to Canada. So then there was an audition for bass players, and uh, I had learned uh, to play the bass by being around Joe Osborne, who Mike DeRoe, who I mentioned to you was my engineer when I was still uh, in the 11th grade in high school, um, became my mentor. And really after the production um, deal ended because the label uh, closed, um, I started thinking I could be a you know studio musician, but I just w wasn't up to where the guys were at those times. I mean, they were, you know, Glenn Campbell was playing guitar, Barney Kessel, James Burton, um, many Tommy of Tedesco, you know. Yeah, yeah, they, they were they were just avid readers, you know, they could sit down and just read fly paper and I wasn't to that. So I, I decided rather than go back to San Bernardino, I would just uh, ask Mike DeRoe if I could work as an apprentice and and work with him as a um, as a recording engineer. So they, uh, he let me do that. That was at uh, Bob Hudson's studio. Uh, Bob Hudson uh, was a, a number one DJ at KRLA for many, many years, around 1965, 64. And um, so I apprenticed under him and started really learning how to, uh, to become an engineer. Um, and through that process, I was able to actually meet a lot of people. Uh, and one of the people that I met is that Mike and I built this recording studio for these two guys out of Shreveport, Louisiana, named Sonny Jones and Al Jones. And their sister, can't remember her name, but was married to Hank Williams and um, Johnny Horton. Mm -hmm. And um, when we got the studio finished, they said they were going to bring some of their friends over to kind of make some demos to check it out. Well, their friends happened to be James Burton, Joe Osborne. Roger Miller, Dorsey nice. Burnett, you know, just all these great rockabilly players that that I remember seeing as a kid. I'm now, you know, turning knobs for these guys, and I'm thinking, man, this is this. It doesn't get any better than this. And so, Joe Osborne um, wanted to build a studio. I'm getting a, getting to this in a roundabout way, but Joe Osborne wanted to build a studio. Now I'd met him obviously in the studios, and he couldn't afford to pay me just one of us, which would be Mike, because he was really the, the uh, technical engineer. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll agree to help him as an assistant. If when you're home and you have some time, I, I would really appreciate to learn a little bit more about bass playing. I'd like to start playing bass on my own records. And so he said, yeah, I'll do that. And so um, I'd spend time with him and he talked to me about his amps and guitars and his style of picking and um, how important it was to learn to read charts and read a little bit of rhythm. You know, he says you don't have to read a lot, but once you recognize a pattern, you'll see that pattern. And you'll know what it is. It's kind of like seeing the word stop and knowing that that means stop. And I said, I get it. So um, Buffalo Springfield had lost their bass player. So they held an addition, audition. And uh, I had asked Neil, I said, look, can I audition for that? He said, yeah, sure, why not? So I went down to the old Moulin Rouge, which is where they were holding the auditions. And there was 12 people before me. And they had auditioned everybody. And they, Neil says, is there anybody else out there we've missed? And I raised my hand and I said, yeah, me. Oh, Jimmy. Yeah. OK, come up. So I came up. I was the last one. And I plugged in. And they started playing. and. 
Stephen looked at me like, wow, you know this material? And, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I've only spent two years here. This <laughs> hit me in the head. But they had no idea that I was a musician. This is nothing I ever talked about. In fact, they didn't know I was a guitar player. They just, at that moment, thought, wow, he's a great bass player. And so I got the job. So now I'm working as their engineer, producer, and now their bass player. And um, it was a wonderful experience because, you know, for me, um, engineering was, was not simple, but it was something I knew well. And um, the production is something I had started when I was, you know, still 15 years old in high school. Um, and playing bass was exciting because I got to learn from one of the greatest bass players I thought of all time was Joe Osborne. So I, everything is working for me. Uh, and I'm in, very much enjoying the process. And uh, that kind of brought us up to the point where the next exciting thing that happened are are shouldn't say exciting but frightening thing that happened was that we went on a tour with the with the beach boys which lends me to the question you had about being at liberty hall but three days before that uh, martin luther king was assassinated and our tours were starting in the south and it was extremely troubling time uh, not only with the loss of dr king but just the uneasiness that was happening in the South at that time. So a lot of dates were canceled. Um, we had a lot of experiences where in those days, if you had long hair in the South, uh, you were, you were low man on the totem pole. And uh, at that time, I remember in order to get on the beach boys tour, we had to all have a mantra, uh, had to, had to go through that whole thing that Mike love was putting everybody through and um, meditation and all that. And so we were meditating one time in the South at an airport. They had about a couple hours and we went inside, Richie and I to meditate and we're sitting there with our eyes closed and all of a sudden the lights come on, <laughs> the cops come in and they said, what are you boys doing here? And we said, well, we're meditating. He said, well, you could meditate your asses right out of here. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were thrown out. Um, Anyway, yeah, it's all good. I've got to ask you a couple of things here because you mentioned Cross earlier. And I, first of all, Steve Postel, have you done any work with him? You know, Steve? I, I do know Steve, yeah. Yeah, he's a great guy. I've been, uh, I've done a couple of shows with him and Leland Sklar and uh, those guys, immediate family. They're, they're great. Another one, uh, when you mentioned, Martin Luther King, it brought to mind Stack Studios, a good friend of mine that lives here in El Paso, Terry Manning. I don't know if you know Terry, but they just did that uh, show on uh, Max TV this week, the uh, documentary on Stax, the studio, Stax Records. And uh, Terry has one of the very last photographs of Martin Luther King. In fact, Terry was the one that took him to the hotel and everything, you know, right? It's it's an interesting story. He talks about it in that documentary. You might want to check it out. Let me you know, write that down. What's it called? The Stax documentary. Yeah, it's called uh, Stax Records. Um, trying to remember. Uh, Soul. I think it's Soul something USA. Anyway, you can go on Max right now. It's it's streaming right now. There's four episodes, and it's really good, man. It goes through. Steve Cropper, you know, Steve's the one that hired Terry when he left El Paso. He went out to Memphis and uh, uh, he talks what, all about about the studio. Terry, what's Terry play? Terry plays guitar and sings and writes. He's got a okay. studio here. He used to own Compass Records in the Bahamas. And okay. uh, he's he's produced Led Zeppelin, ZZ Top, you know, George Thorogood, a bunch of them, man. Uh, I've done some work with him in, uh, in the Sonic Ranch Studios here in El Paso. Um, anyway, we've, um, then there was another one I wanted to mention. You were talking about dragsters earlier out in LA when you were starting out, but it brought something to mind. KRLA, when the Bobby Fuller four were doing their recordings, they did one right there with a, on their album cover with a dragster from KRLA. Do you remember anything about that? That would have been around 65, around that same time. To be, in, to be honest with you, you just, uh, Bob, what was his name? The producer, Bob. Bob Keen. Uh, yeah, I worked for Bob Keen 
as an engineer uh, right after Bobby Fuller had um, been, I guess, killed. Yes. <clears throat> and um, uh, I was right, right there in the midst of all of that when uh, Stevens uh, had his first 24 track or 16 track. I can't remember what it was. And, and Barry White was working for Bob King as a new talent. And um, Barry and I uh, used to work together doing a, <laughs> he, he was crazy. Um, <laughs> he, it was interesting because he was like kind of, he's so big and powerful. And I remember when we were <laughs> recording, he'd be beating on those drums. And I thought, my God, he's going to break a head. It's just going to, and he used to talk to me like that. Hey, Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy, go ahead and get it. Anyway, we became very good friends um, working together. And just as a sideline, I remember I was at the Grammy Awards and uh, I'm walking up the hall and I hear this voice say, Hey, Jimmy, Jimmy. And I look over there and he's sitting in the very back and it's hard to see him. And he goes, Barry White. <laughs> and I went, Barry. And he goes, How you doing, buddy? And it was so great because he, he remembered me after all those years and, you know, why he would, I, I don't know, but it was very sweet for him to, uh, and by this time he's extremely successful. And uh, anyway, Bob Keen, yes, Bobby Fuller, Bob, Bobby Fuller four. I fought the law and the law won. Yeah. Um, right after he died, Jim Reese and Dalton Powell, Dalton is one of my best friends, a drummer, um, Jim Reese played in my band for three years when he came back to El Paso. He joined up with us and, and we, we were, God, it was, it was a great group. We worked six nights a week the whole time I was going to college here at UTEP and from uh, 60, so, 69 so Bobby, to 72. So Bobby was from uh, El Paso? Yes. He wasn't, no, born, he wasn't born here, but he lived a good part of his life. And when they left to go out to LA, uh, you know, of course he got killed in 66, but, uh, he had already been out there briefly. They had been playing. Oh gosh. Um, trying to remember some of the places they played out there. I don't think they played the Troubadour, but I do. I'm thinking of the. Probably you know, played the Red Velvet, maybe. The Red Velvet. Uh, don't think the Baked Potato. I'm trying to think of. Um, uh, seems like it starts with a P. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Well, there was there was the Red Velvet, and then there was where Johnny Rivers used to play. The Whiskey a Go Go. Well, yeah, there was the Whiskey at Gogo, but he also used to play at another place called uh, – Start. I think it did start with a P. It was um, – We're thinking of the same place, I know. Yeah, yeah. there was only like three or four places in those days that people used to play at. Troubadour was more folk music. Yeah. Whis whiskey was rock, and, and um, um, but there was another one called the – I'll think of it in a second. My brain has yeah. to – we'll, we'll see who thinks of it first. <laughs> yeah. But I, I grew up in Heartland, in Texas, <clears throat> down um, near Brownsville. Uh, right. As a kid. The uh, yeah. I got to ask you also, uh, Howard Steele, Studio Fifty Five. Did you ever do any work with him and Richard Perry over there? No. Yeah. No, I knew Richard Perry was represented by the same attorney as I was, so we'd, we'd see each other on holidays and things like that. Sure. Well, moving right, you know, we could talk forever. I, I wanted to ask you about. The story, I, I, I heard the story, and I love it, about the Rusty Young story, New York. You want to talk about that a little bit? That's, that's really a cool one, Forming po Poco. Um, I'm not sure what story it is. Uh, about the steel guitar? Oh, when, when, he first, when I first met him, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Rusty, uh, it, it was interesting because... I had taken the Buffalo Springfield. Uh, actually, I, let's start over. Take two. Um, could not get the studio uh, and the band together at the same time. Um, the band just they, for some reason, they didn't like working together. Didn't want to work together, or, or couldn't. They weren't organized, which is probably why Ahmed asked me to produce them. So um, I, I told. Ahmed, I called him and I said, listen, I'm having a hard time getting these guys to show up there. They all got certain things they're doing here in town. And, and um, he said, well, maybe we should bring them to New York. I said, yeah, why not? And I'd never been there before. But anyway, we, um, he, he gets his tickets. So we booked the flight and uh, 
I show up at the airport and, you know, Dewey's there, Richie's there, um, Stephen's there, but I'm not seeing Neil anywhere, but I figure maybe he's running late. We get to New York and I see Stephen. He's got his cowboy hat on. He's up front and, you know, Dewey's got his fringe jacket. He's there and Richie and I are standing next to one another and I wait for Neil to get off, but no Neil. Um, so we ended up checking in the hotel. Next morning, I've got a session uh, booked and uh, nobody shows up except for Richie and I. So um, I, I, I told Ahmed, I said, I, I really need to get started here. And I, I don't know what to do. He says, well, let's, we'll get, you know, I'll get you with Arif Mardin. And Arif said, I'll get you the best cats in New York. So I said, great. So we start that session that evening. Well, one of the greatest bass players of all time, you know, Richard Davis shows up, did such a great job, especially on Carefree Country Day. Um, so the first one of the first songs we do um, is "Kind Woman," and I'm explaining to them that you know this is a it's a country song, but it's more of a ballad, and um, I want it to feel not like modern country, but I want it to feel countryish. Oh, okay, we can do that. Well, the keyboard player, who's probably a brilliant keyboardist never been probably to Nashville ever in his life, decides that that means playing like Floyd Kramer. <laughs> so, but da, 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 you know, and I'm, we get this song done. <clears throat> we get everything done. We get back to California and we're working on Richie's song, Kind Woman. And I said, Richie, you know, there's, there's something that's just not right about this. Um, it's just, too jazzy it needs to have it needs to be brought back into where we are now, of course neil had done um some songs um, that had some jazz elements to it so i wasn't feeling too bad about getting too far away from it because he'd already been there uh on uh, broken arrow and stuff um i said but i think what we ought to do is we had we had James Burton come in and play Dobro and Child's Claim to Fame. And I said, why don't we grab a local steel guitar player and maybe that'll m make it work better, um, given a more of a country flavor. Um, he said, yeah, that's a good idea. So I thought about, you know, Red Rhodes or, or Sneaky Pete or Buddy Emmons and a friend of ours who was actually a roadie at that time. He said, you know, I know this young guy who lives in uh, Colorado who um, is really a good steel guitar player, and he might just be perfect for you guys. So um, I said, well, that's going to be expensive. we got to fly him out. we got to get him a hotel. He's got to eat. He says, yeah, well, those steel guitar players, they make triple scale. Hell, you'll be paying seven, 800 bucks for one of those guys if you're lucky. And hell, we a hundred bucks we can fly them out and hotel rooms are 25 bucks a night <clears throat> and i said well you know what <clears throat> let's give it a try so he says uh the guy's name is rusty and uh we brought him out <clears throat> we're sitting in the studio he opens up his steel and they apparently they had thrown it off the plane because it was too heavy they didn't want to lift it <clears throat> and broke it of course this was rusty's big chance to you know play on a, an album where guys are his own age and you know it was just not serviceable so i said well i'll tell you what um stephen bought a steel guitar on the road and um at a hawk shop and hell i got it in the back here you know he says well bring it out so we brought it out it's i think it was a fender and it had cables on it whereas rusty's had these beautiful stainless steel rods that lifted the strings up a third or down a fourth or into a minor or whatever. <clears throat> and this Fender did the same thing, but it did it in opposite ways. And Rusty never said a word, but he, he put it upside down and started tinkering with it and tightening the cables. And we brought it up there while the country neck wouldn't work. 
there was something wrong with the pickup was gone. That's probably why we got it so cheap. Um, but the the jazz neck, which is tuned to a a C9 chord, worked. Again, I don't know anything about it. He's not mentioning a damn thing. He's just putting it together. So um, set him up. We plug him in. We run the song by. He's sitting in the studio. Um, I get everything right, and the sound's working. And uh, we make a pass. And I said, okay, uh, Rusty, let's, uh, let's do one for real now. I, I got the level set. So in the middle of that take, <clears throat> a number of, of weeks before um, this session happened, Richie and I were driving in, the, in a car. I think we were going to Saturday in Chapin, someplace in San Francisco guitar shop. And I asked him, I says, what do you want to do when you leave the Buffalo Springfield? Do you have plans? He goes, no, I don't have any plans. And I said, well, I wouldn't mind working with you. Maybe we could put a group together. Um, I know, you know, we've been doing folk rock, but I, I really think maybe, you know, we should think about putting more country into the, into the music. And uh, especially with your songs like Kind Woman and Child's Claim to Fame, I said it would make more sense to do country rock as opposed to folk rock. So, well, I don't know, you know, we'll just have to wait and see. So fast forward now we're in the session and here's Rusty and he's in the middle of playing a guitar solo. And I'm going, my God, this guy is great. He sounds great. And I look over to Richie and I said, remember that conversation we had in the backseat of the car? And he goes, yeah. And I said, well, maybe this is, this is the guy we need to, to make that music happen. And he said, wow, yeah. And so we got it recorded. And um, subsequent to that album being released, the uh, group breaks up and... Uh, Richie and I call upon Rusty to come out and see about forming a band. So that's kind of how the uh, how Poco got started at the end of Buffalo Springfield. Speaking of Richie, Jim, are you going to see him when you're up in Colorado on your next tour? Uh, hopefully, I uh, I called uh, to see if he would like to sit in. I think we're playing in Inglewood, uh, uh, Colorado, and so he said, "Yeah, I'd like to." So I sent him a couple of tunes. I to brush up on um, uh, You Better Think Twice and uh, Kind Woman. Um, I do the song the way he originally wrote it uh, with all the odd bars. Uh, assume you're a musician, you'll understand the difference between a 4-4 four, four measure, a 3-4 measure, and a 5-4 measure, and, uh, and a 2-4 measure. And, and in those days, he didn't have any clue I don't think he still does of what that is. Um, but he wrote this brilliant song with all these uh, measures in it. Like, I got a good reason for rest. Love as a two, four measure in the middle of three, four. And then he goes, kind of woman. I Did love it. the harmony on that, man. I love the harmony. It's just, to me, I just love the original arrangement. Uh, love the harmonies. Um, Richie has straightened all the time out. And I've said, no, 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 I, I can't do that. He, well, I can't do it. Then, you know what? Here's the music. Here's the way you wrote it. Here's the way we do it. Take a listen to it. And believe me, it'll be a lot easier once you realize you're only resting a beat each time you sing a phrase. So hopefully he'll get it um, and work at it. But we're going to have him do Kind Woman with us. Um, probably a, I'll start off singing the uh, first verse and let him sneak in and, and then sing the second verse as a surprise for the audience. That'll and be then, cool. And then we'll do, um, you know, you better think twice together. I got to tell you, uh, Jim, I, I woke up at six this morning. Some of my best creative work happens when I'm sleeping. And I think of stuff that I want to do with my interviews and all. And, uh, and then I'll grab my iPhone real quick and jot down notes and then put it to the plan. That happened to me this morning, I and I've never done this before, but I thought it'd be kind of fun to do this with you. When I woke up, I was thinking just randomly, of, I came up with seven songs. These were seven songs that five of which we did of, of yours when we were traveling on the road, traveling all over the country. And what I want to do with you is I'm going to mention these songs individually, 
but I want to get a response from you, one to three words, an interactive response to each one of these songs. Okay. There's well, no right, there's no wrong. I just uh, want to hear what you're going to say. Okay. All right. Okay. We're going to start out with for what it's worth. Inspirational. Mr. Soul. Mm. I'm thinking Rolling Stones. <laughs> Kind Woman. Mm. Love at its best. I got a good reason for loving you It's an old-fashioned sign I kinda get to feeling like Your mama don't dance. Dealing with my parents. Your mama don't dance and your daddy don't rock and roll. Your daddy don't rock and roll, your daddy don't rock and roll. Your mama don't dance and your daddy don't rock and roll. Your daddy don't rock and roll, your daddy don't rock and roll. Angry eyes. I'm taking the fifth on that one. Yeah. 
Thinking of you. Inspired by a young lady working at CBS. And one of my most favorite, and we did it so many times and got standing ovations, Danny's song. Mm. How do I say this? Uh, The reason why I hesitate is because it was one of the first songs that uh, Kenny brought to me. And it's also one of the first songs that he and I performed together before we were ever even performing uh, at a state hospital where we were raising money for children who were um, challenged, let's say, um, and it was my father-in-law, Barry Sullivan, whose son was at that hospital. And I remember that it was not a popular song yet. It was just a song, really. And um, the people that were there were very grateful that we came and played music. Um, it's one of those songs that had meaning before it ever had meaning, to me anyway. And it did, uh, was appreciated by people who hadn't bought it or heard it before. Uh, and it was for a good cause. Um, it, it's hard to explain what that song is. I mean, I know what it is because Kenny wrote it. He or Dan Latimos or whoever's on there as a writer. Um, but it's had a, it's had such a um, compelling an emotional effect to people. Uh, it's hard to, to know how something like that happens and so many people feel the same thing, but it's one of those songs that um, kind of has a life of its own. A life of its own, there you go. You know, um, I watched the reunion concert or part of the reunion concert that you did with Kenny, I think it was what, 2005, something like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that was the last song you all did. And to, to see the audience reaction, I mean, that sums it all up right there. We couldn't leave you without doing the first song we ever sang together. And, uh, I think it's fitting that it'd be the last song we sing with you all tonight. It's called Happy Birthday. No, I'm <laughs> People smile and tell me I'm a lucky one. And we've just begun. Think I'm gonna have a son. He will be like she and me, as free as a dove, conceived in love. The sun is gonna shine above. Here we go. Of 
my girl in Rose and Merlin in a paper cup. Come on and drink it up. Love her and she'll bring you love. If you find she helps your mind, brother, dig her own bone. Boy, don't you never know. Try to earn what lovers own. Everybody, even though we ain't got money, I'm so in love with you. I need everything will bring the chain of love. In the morning when I rise, bring a tear of joy to my eyes and tell me everything. Yes, indeed. God bless. Thank you. Drive safe. Thank you all. And don't pull any wheelies going out of the parking lot either. You yeah. had everybody in that audience singing on that chorus. It was, I mean, it just gives me chills thinking about it. It was so, so great. Yeah, I, I do that song um, in my show, and the, I get the audience singing uh, on it. And uh, it, it's sweet to to look out there and, and see their faces and and the joy it gives them. It's a uh, it's one of those songs where um, that and your mama don't dance and and uh, be free, uh, angry eyes. They all have compelling effects emotionally, all different uh, on an audience. So. I think as a, you know, I started a class many years ago called the Songwriters Performance Workshop. And one of the elements that I, I, I facilitate is not how to write a hit song, but to, to guide them into learning how to make contact to the, to the core of the listener, the emotional core of that listener. And, and my process of explaining the paradigm of which how that happens and how to get that to happen. Um, it's really what I, uh, I work for um, when I'm writing a song and an arrangement, because they're all part of the same thing. I, I explained it to some of my uh, students was that I, I'd get people who would write these lyrics and then write these melodies uh, and then the rhythms to go to them, it felt like you were standing on two plates of the earth and one moving in one direction and the other. And how sometimes their lyrics would say one thing, but the tempo would say something else. And how important it is to, to understand the, the affect and the connection uh, and the symbiotic relationship between the rhythm and melody and lyric and how they, you know, it's kind of like, I remember many years ago, Steven Spielberg, when he was first starting, we're about the same age. He was doing a movie called Clear and Present Danger uh, that Barry Sullivan was starring in. And uh, he, even after they finished the movie, Steven would come up and visit Barry because he really liked him a lot. And I remember having one conversation with him in which I asked him, you know, what what role does really music play in your you know, making movies. And at that time, you know, he was very young. Both of us were. And um, he said something that really uh, stuck to me. And that is that he said, you know, music really needs to highlight while it underscores what's going on in the scene. And um, in order to give life and energy to what it is that you're watching. And, um, and after a while of listening to him talk, I suddenly realized, you know, that music songs uh, are, are not much different than a movie. The difference is I'm I'm not projecting uh, with light onto a screen what I'm what I'm doing. So I have to figure out a way to do that where with rhythm and melody and lyrics that that actually create that 
synergistically create that screen in your mind, which is what my workshop was about. It's explaining to them that, you know, we have this core in all of us where we store everything that we've ever experienced in our life from birth to the present. And that as a songwriter, there are moments where those emotions want to launch out. And I explain my paradigm is very much like the planet Saturn, where you have the planet, then you have these rings that, that are around it. And the first ring is the feeling state. You have your emotional body, your feeling state. And once that emotion launches, it goes to the first state where you begin to have feelings about an emotion. And it's not necessarily anything but energy. And you know, sometimes when you, when I or you get a feeling about something, it can make you feel excited. It can make you feel angry. It can make you feel happy. It can make you feel joy, but doesn't necessarily have anything attached to it until you get into the next ring, which is the imaginary state where you, where you either have pictures, you see pictures about that feeling, or you have thoughts about that feeling. And the last state is the verbal state in which you either put words, uh, music um, to those images or thoughts, which are have feelings that are emotionally based. <clears throat> and if you can actualize that experience, put your emotions and the feelings, give them images or thoughts, and then verbally convey them, your listener has the same emotional body. The first thing they do is they hear it. Once they hear it, they'll have either an image about what it creates, or they'll have a thought. And that thought or image will create a feeling. And if the feeling has anything, any substance to it, <clears throat> it will then resonate an emotional part in your core. And that's what I call going core to core. When you can write a song, project it out, and have somebody hear it and experience it, that's what I call a predictable response. And the only way you can have that is to have performed the song and had somebody in your class or everybody in the class experience the same thing. Once that happens, then you can know you can go from, from set to set, song to song, and people will have the same reaction. Basically, what you just talked about with Danny's song, where it doesn't matter what audience you play it in, 99% of the time you perform it, it's going to have a predictable response. There's, nobody's going to stand up and say, man, that's a piece of shit, right? Yeah, that's it, right. It just doesn't happen. So as a creative person, as a producer, as a songwriter, those are the elements in which I teach in my workshop that I work on uh, myself doesn't mean I can do it every time, but I know, I know what it smells like when it's good. There's a friend of mine and you may know him, Stephen McClintock, uh, who has done a lot of these songwriter workshops. Uh, he's a producer as well, has written a lot of great songs. He's done a lot of movie soundtracks and he, uh, Actually, he, he got his first gold record uh, writing for Tiffany, if you remember Tiffany. Yeah, I do. Yeah, and, and he lives, I think he lives in Long Beach. We, we stay in touch quite a bit, and he's brought a lot of uh, connections to me uh, for interviews and stuff, you know, with people that he's worked with, uh, Michael Peterson out of Las Vegas, and uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of them out there that are just really incredible writers, and, and uh, but why I'm telling you about him is that the first time I did a show with him, we talked about his writing for uh, one of the songs that he did that Andy Williams did. It was a Christmas song and uh, really a beautiful song. And he did it in Branson at his theater there. Uh, Andy Williams did. And uh, anyway, and we, he played that song, but we also, he did one about singing about his son and, and I, I had that same reaction that we were talking about with Danny's song when I heard that, because basically the father's singing about his son and, and how his son sees him as the father. And I mean, boy, it just ripped me, man. I, it just gets me every time I hear it. Beautiful, beautifully well done. And, uh, 
And I, it's that kind of song that you're talking about, you know, I'm what's, sure. What's the song called? I can't even think of the name of it, but I'll text it to you. When I talk to Stephen, I'll get the proper title and I'll see if I can uh, get a copy of it, a video of it or something, and I'll send it to you, but it, it, you'll like it. It's really well, well done. Um, okay. There is so much I want to talk to you about, and we're already into an hour. I, I, I want to talk about your Nashville band. Talk about your new group. Uh, that you've put together there, uh, you know, the guys, I've loved the musicality of this group. I love the harmonies. I love what you've done with this, with these guys. Talk a little bit about how you came about this new group. Well, I was, you know, I had moved to Franklin in 2018 and I've been working with musicians that I adored and love. Uh, Michael Brady, who was bass player on my uh, second album, I think the Messina album, and uh, we'd performed and known each other for years. Uh, Craig Thomas, who played saxophone all the way from the Oasis, was still working with me. Um, I had David Byer on drums, uh, great, great drummer. Um, uh, Gary Oliar on violin, and we'd been working together quite quite a long time, and I, I moved to Franklin, and for the first couple of years, I, I tried to tour with that band and the problem was that first of all i was getting to the point where i was starting to perform places more than once or twice uh pretty much playing the same music each time and i wanted to move into my solo works uh, and one of the problems i had with that was i needed a keyboard player and uh i really couldn't afford to have five guys plus myself six people on the road at that time and i <laughs> I, it was too expensive for me to fly people from New York. Two guys lived in New York, you know, on the East Coast. Uh, two guys lived on the West Coast. And to be able to have rehearsals spent, hotels, flights, um, all of which was becoming very, very expensive. And so my agent said, look, you know, there's a lot of musicians here in Nashville. Um, they're not all country players. And he said, you should really consider perhaps augmenting what you have plus he says you know from from nashville you can drive within two days almost of any place up to the rocky mountains uh and there's a lot more engagements here for you so i got to thinking and i thought well i do need to make a change and, and get some new solo works in like i wanted to bring in loving you every minute i wanted to bring in um new and different way I had the song that had been recorded by Brooks and Dunn named, uh, it was uh, Mexican Minutes. Um, I had a number of songs that I needed to progress with. So I decided to start looking around and see what I could find. And um, I managed to find some really, really great players. I won't go into the extent to which that happened, but it was over a, a good year and a half. But my players now uh, are drums. I got Jack Bruno. Uh, who's just a great drummer, played with Tina Turner, uh, Joe Cocker. He was with Delbert McClinton for a number of years before Delbert retired. Just a solid, great player, you know. Um, and um, I managed to pull in Stevie Nieves, who was with me uh, and Kenny on 2005, that uh, video that you saw. Mm -hmm. He's one of the sax players and percussionist uh, and vocalist. He's great. Uh, and I pulled in um, James Frazier, who was, who's really a guitarist, but everyone kind of thought he was also a really great keyboard player. And I brought him in. He wasn't too confident he could play the parts. And I said, you know, I think you can. You just need to listen to them and, and spend a little time. And mm -hmm. he did. And my God, when I heard this album that we're working on right now, which is a live album, he was able to capture the feeling of what I did on Oasis as well as that was, you know, with Jim Studer playing, who's a jazz player. He managed to pull out what Victor Feldman played on keyboards on Loving You Every Minute. Um, I was just so impressed with his talent. Um, he uh, underplays his abilities, uh, as does the bass player I have right now, uh, Ben King. Ben King's about 33. He's a year older than my son. And he's a he's really an old soul. He's he plays all uh, country, modern jazz, funk. Um, he's a high singer. 
um, fits the bills that I need for the Larry Simses of the world or the Tim Schmitz that had sung some of those parts before. So the band consists of bass, drums, keyboards, percussionists who doubles on uh, sax, well, actually he's a saxophone doubles on keyboards and vocals. So we have four vocalists in the band, um, really, really great players. Um, they have uh, bellied up to the bar on everything when it comes to the parts. Um, and we're getting standing ovations almost on four or five of the songs every night. Um, people are, we're selling out shows, um, sometimes two nights in a row. And I, we're just now, I'm start starting to get, I want to do a live album with them first because I find that most audiences, when we go to play, they go, wow, I really love that music. Which album can I buy that has those guys on it? Right. Right. Yeah. So I want to get, get this album out first, this live album. And then I'm working on doing a studio album with the guys. And, uh, I want to, uh, one of the things I learned about, you know, producing and being in Poco was that the worst thing you can ever do is to get pigeonholed. And so many artists in the past have been pigeonholed for, they either do jazz or they do rock or they do country or they do this, and then they're never allowed out of that spot. And one of the reasons why I chose to, to work with Kenny was because he had, a versatile sounding voice. He loved singing like other singers. That was how I used to make a living by writing songs for a publishing company. If they needed a, a Leon Russell tune, he could sing like Leon Russell or, or Elton John or you name it, he could do it and was excited over the fact that he could do that. And my thought was, you know, if I can put out an album that has a diverse amount of material on it, uh, he might have a better chance at having a hit than we did in Poco, um, which is why the first Sit and Then album is so diverse from country to rock to folk, to, you know, to um, maybe even some light jazz on that. I, I can't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. But fast forward to where I'm at now, that's one of the reasons why I think I'm, I'm able to maintain um, the continuity of my career is that I'm very, very diverse in what I do, but it requires very, very diverse musicians. And these guys really fit the bill. And so when I go in to do the, uh, the studio album, which will probably won't do a full album. I think in this day and age, uh, it doesn't make sense to that. You grab two or three tunes and create something and put it out there and, and see how it works. Um, it's a different business than, the, than it was you know, back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But um, they're just great people to work with. Uh, we're all in sync. You know, we're... We don't smoke or do drugs or, you know, chase women. We all have wives and families and um, we're all of the age to where we really appreciate where we've gotten to. And most important, we love to play. And um, it shows in all of their performances. They're just so good. I, I feel like when I used to have a tennis court, uh, I'm not a very good tennis player, but I always had people over that were better than me so that I could learn and get better at what I did. And I, I have to say, I think all of these guys are better than I am. <laughs> so they keep me on my toes. You know, when we, uh, with my last group out in LA, that, that rings really true to what, what I've said a, a bunch of times. Um, I'm a singing drummer, but I, I always liked playing with guys that were better than me because you're always going to be at the top of your game and, and want to learn, you know, from these guys. And, uh, and when we were out there, we were going to Dick Grove's workshop, you know, uh, studying with Tommy Tedesco and Lee Rettenauer. And I was working with guys like Louis Belson and Ed Shaughnessy and Richie Lepore and all these great drummers, man. It was just wonderful, you know, being out there and, and at the time and being around all this. So, you, you know, you just eat it up, you know, but there's so much more I wanted to cover with you today, but I've got some editing to do and I want to make this thing really good. I want to put some more stuff in here, uh, music wise. Um, but what I, we can, what we can do is why don't we do a, uh, a second take at some point in time and then, you know, get this one to where you want it and, uh, we'll pick up and do this again, maybe around some shows that we have. I know I'm, I'm going to be heading to Texas pretty soon. I talked to my agent about that. I don't know exactly when, 
uh, but you know, whatever you want to do. Let it, let it, me know if you're when you come to Texas. If you're going to go to Austin area, whatever. Both of our kids live in Austin, and uh, uh, our son's at the Moody Theater all the time. He's a photographer for Getty Images, so he's always shooting shows. In fact, he's getting ready to go to Nashville. He works. Uh, he's going to be there, I think, on the fourth or fifth for like three or four days during his birthday. He's going to be at Blake Shelton's Old Red, your club oh, really? there. Yeah, oh. this will be his third year to come in and and uh, do a, an assignment there at Old Red with with Blake Shelton. So um, he's going to be doing his thing there. But when you get to Texas, Jim, let me know, particularly like if you're around El Paso at all. Of course, we're out here in the in the west end of where nobody wants us, you know. Um, but I would love to uh, to see your new group if we can make the timing work. If you're uh, over around Austin, maybe we can go visit the kids and, and, uh, and see, see you guys, you know, it'd be really, really cool, you know, but let's definitely do a part two because I would like to also cover more about your new album, the live and the studio album. Maybe we can put a little bit of, uh, some cuts in there and, and promote it for you. That'd be great. You know, the best thing to do is don't leave it up to me is Phyllis, your contact, uh, that you made with, she has, our schedule and knows exactly when and where I'm going to be more, more so than I do half the time. Okay. Well, she's been great. And I really appreciate, you know, I, we had to work this morning thing out because I know that's when you, you know, like to do these, you know, to, to make it work with your schedule. But, um, but you know, I've got about another 30 or 45 minutes of stuff that I could have worked in here with you today, but I'm glad we got done what we did because you are a, you're a great storyteller. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, and, and I just want to kind of close this thing by, by telling you that, um, first of all, it's been a privilege and a pleasure to play your, your music coast to coast to include Canada. You know, I did that for six straight years on the road. And, uh, and that was from 73 till 78. And, uh, and I, and I want to thank you for your talent your your passion for performing great music jim and allowing me the opportunity to include you with my talk and rock artist alumni you know i really uh, i've had some great interviews but you're you're up there with some of the great ones man i really appreciate your time and and uh and and working with me on this man you're one of the great ones was very kind of you i have a question behind your left shoulder there there's uh -huh. a there's a photograph just to the uh, I guess to the right of the Bobby Fuller drum, and and who's who is that wearing that white hat there? That guy up there, his name is Angelo Amoriello. I used to manage their band. They were called Route Sixty Six, and that was at a show that I used to produce called the Border Legends of El Paso, and uh, that was where I would bring back the groups of the '60s and '70s. Um, in fact. Randy Fuller of the Bobby Fuller Four, um, God bless his soul. We lost him about five days ago. He just passed away. And uh, but who was it? Who was it? Bobby that... Full, Bobby Fuller's brother, Randy Fuller. Oh wow! That's Actually, he goes, but he went by Randall Fuller. And uh, okay. but we a lot of us called him Randy, but but most of us called him Randall. But uh, yeah, he was living out in Colton, California, and he just passed. Uh, and, Col and Colton, why, why Colton? I don't know. I don't know why, but he, he lived out there for a long time, you know, that's and where, uh, that's, where, that's where I went to high school. Really? Oh, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, he's been out there a long time and, um, yeah, it's, uh, but yeah, that's who that was. And I was playing drums behind Angelo and in his band there, Route 66. Angelo, what, what, kind of, what kind of music did you play? Well, that was, like route 66 it was everything from beatles to you know you name it you know proud uh -huh. mary they did it all all covers no original uh -huh. stuff it was just a cover band and That's uh music of the one. music of the 60s and 70s uh you know everything you know just you name it it, it was all pretty much covered they didn't do for what it's worth <laughs> or mr soul yeah. but well, uh, that, would, that wouldn't have fit that wouldn't have fit at all <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, they're, they're great guys. He's, he's now living over in uh, the Austin area. He left El Paso. Uh, Angelo did. He and his wife built a house over uh, 
in a, and they're living in a place called Kissing Tree, right? Uh, about 30 minutes from Austin and Dripping Springs. But uh, Well, you know, my sister lived in Dripping Springs, and my uh, brother-in-law was the sheriff of Hayes County, Texas, Paul Hastings, and uh, wow. was uh, my family were all in Austin for quite a while, and uh, he worked as a chief investigating officer for the DA's office in, uh, in Austin before he became sheriff. So those are all stomping grounds for me. Well, I, I love it. You know, and, we, places, and I had to be nice and where, otherwise I'd be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard well, to miss me when your parent, when your family's in law enforcement, you, you got to, you know, try walk a straight line. <laughs> well, and Angelo, Angelo there, he's a drummer, a singing drummer as well, but, on this particular song, I'm playing drums and he's out front on it. So he could get out front and do his thing. It was pretty, pretty cool. Um, and he's a New Jersey guy. He's from New Joy. He's from Joysey, Joysey City. Joy. Yeah. yeah. But, you just let fellas know when you want to get back together. and We'll try to schedule it in for you. I will, buddy. Thank you so much, Jim. I really enjoyed it. Have a good Perfect. rest of your week, a weekend. And, uh, you know, get her done, man. All righty, buddy. Take care. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.